was January 17th of 1997. My mom, my oldest brother, Jesse, and I were planning to go to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, we need to do some car maintenance and we were gonna see a movie. It used to be a windy kind of mountain road to get to Coeur d'Alene. Um, and that day we slipped on black ice into oncoming traffic on a curve. And there happened to be a pretty big um, utility truck on that lane that we hit them. I was five and I was in the back seat behind my mom driving and I had taken off the shoulder strap and just had the belt strap on because it was rubbing on my neck and what happened is I hit, I like just went forward so quickly that I snapped my spinal cord. I remember being in the car right after it happened and thinking I was getting really tired and I remember telling myself like don't fall asleep because you may never wake up again. I was born in Burns, Oregon, and then I moved to Tico, Washington when I was two and lived there the rest of my life. Tico is a very small farming community. It's 800 people and it's surrounded by wheat and lentil fields. So they're rolling hills, very agricultural, but just about five miles east of us is the Idaho border and that's the Idaho Panhandle. So it's Northern Idaho, which is very mountainous. You basically see nature wherever you look, um, whether that's wheat fields or you see mountains in the distance. I was a kid who loved being outside. My mom always has had dogs, and so we're the kind of family that takes our dogs on long walks every night. But we would always go bike riding on the trails, swimming in lakes and rivers were a big part of growing up. The best thing my small town community could have ever done for me was treat me exactly the same. I was already learning life as a kindergartner um, using a wheelchair, but the bar wasn't set lower for me. I was still expected to perform my homework, I was still expected to go to recess when everyone else did. And my classmates still asked me to play the same games. So I remember rolling down the hill at recess. And so that meant I had to learn how to get back in my wheelchair on my own. I still was being very physical. Um, we climbed the monkey bars. I did everything that they were doing. And I just, I think because of that, learned how to creatively do it. In third grade, I was excited to play basketball with my classmates, but that was where I realized I had a wheelchair. And I realized that there were some downsides to being in a wheelchair. Um, that was kind of the first time. I was the slowest down the court, so everyone had to wait for me to get there. And then it became a rule they needed to pass me the ball once before we shot a basket. Um, and I felt very patronized, and I just really hated the experience. So I was like, I'm never doing that again. But that's why <laughs> the next year when we learned about a wheelchair basketball team, my mom insisted I go and I was really hesitant. But that day I was around kids in, in wheelchairs playing basketball and it was everything I wanted the year before. I just fell in love with that. It was so freeing that I was finally doing a sport on an even playing field. Um, that that spring when track practice started, they asked if I could come. So I started doing wheelchair racing that year as well, fourth grade. I recruited Susanna when she was in high school, uh, but unfortunately she, she said no, and she went to a school in Montana instead for her first two years. Thank you, Mark. Set. But I, I didn't give up. I kept on her and, and was able to persuade her to, to transfer to U of I when she was a junior. The University of Illinois has been a leader for people with disabilities for decades and it is only getting better and better the more we understand accessibility and the wide needs for accessibility that there are. I remember getting here and I got a email or a text from Adam saying, hey Suze, um, we're doing a half marathon tomorrow morning. And I was, that was my first night at my dorm and I was with my mom and I was like, oh my gosh, I've never done a half marathon before. And I was like, I don't think I can say no. <laughs> um, so I remember getting here, doing my first half marathon. Afterwards, we went to get breakfast together as a group and everyone just got, got to know me from there. I have been here six days a week. When I first got here, I didn't really, my goal was not to have a career in wheelchair racing. I just loved the training part. And I still mostly just love the training part. Now I see it as a career. <laughs>
Scaroni's gone out in front. Susanna Scaroni will come through. And it's going to be very tight between Scaroni and Ballard. I think it's Scaroni who got it. Runs for the American Susanna Scaroni. I would say that long distance shows me. I have a um, mindset, I guess, that matches, you know, this fitness capacity and nutrition capacity where I like to just keep going. In my highest performing athletes, I have to tell them to take a day off. I have to force them to step back from training. They don't, they just don't want to. That's not the way they're built. And, and she shares, she has that characteristic. That's a common point of discussion between us is that I always have to put, pump the brakes on, on her a little bit just so that she can rest, recover, and regenerate and improve and, and, and take advantage of all the hard training. I feel like I've got a whole toolbox if things start to get hard that I can pull out tools to try and make it easier. Um, and I think that is what endurance athletes have. Just ways of making what starts to feel hard a little bit more doable. She really has had a, a breakthrough in her performance since 2020, 2021, coming out of COVID. If I could point to one race, it was at the Tokyo Paralympic Games. 12 and a half laps around the track. Susanna Scaroni is all alone on the screen right now. This is absolutely spectacular. Susanna Scaroni's the champ in the 5,000 and a new Paralympic record. Really one of the most more convincing wins at the Paralympic Games on the track in wheelchair track that I've seen for a long time. I mean, really put a stamp on that she was the one. After Tokyo, um, two weeks later, I was training and I was heading east on Windsor Road, which is four lanes, and I got hit from behind. Um, and I sustained a burst fracture, um, three vertebrae in my back. I did not know what was gonna happen. I was like, what is my life gonna be like with this back injury? Because when you're a wheelchair user, I, I think you just, every, you're very sensitive to anything in your body becoming wounded. <laughs> um, but when it was my back, I was so just like fearful that I may have to adjust my way of living. I had been arguably my best I've ever been at and had some marathons coming up that I really wanted to compete at. So very disappointed, but then immediately after that was so much thankfulness that I was alive. In January of 2022, I was given the okay to get him back in my racing chair. Um, so I started pushing on January 3rd and from there, my racing highlights uh, have been pretty consistent. On your horn. The New York City Marathon was a big highlight because I love that course and that course is hard. This year at around mile 23 was very challenging. That day, I remember doing Amazing Grace, that song Amazing Grace and singing that over and over again to get me up that hard part. I just wanted to meet it and do everything I could and I just did not expect, we had a really good feel that day and I didn't expect to be able to go alone under the course record. The 31 year old American in total control as she wins her first Boston Marathon. I have very effective training right now because I have had so many experiences and I think that has helped, you know, make me be really fast this year because I can re I can actually visualize a time where I'm going to need a skill and then I can practice that skill at training. She's taken that success and, and really has become the number one female in the world. Well, I still think that the hardest challenge I've gone through is not the marathon. Um, but is grad school. And I think it's because it forced me to um, learn. <laughs> a lot of times as I was struggling through grad school, because it was something so different than anything I'd ever done, I would draw upon wheelchair racing for assistance. I was like, why do I love training? And I just hate trying to write this literature review. <laughs> and I would remind myself that when you train Every single morning, you're actually doing exercises to get better and better and better. And now it feels easy and you like that. I needed to read more academic papers. I needed to perform more statistics. I needed to do things that regularly like accumulated and made it feel better and easier. And it took me a while to like realize that. There are many times, especially in the winter, when you know it's snowing and I would like to not push through snow. I love being outside, I always wanted to be a forester. I would love to be able to hike through the woods or 
when I'm in Eugene visiting my family to actually hike up the sand dunes and not get carried. There are many times that I feel that way and I just wish that I could walk. Those are also the times where I realize that I have been given a different perspective and I am very thankful for that and I will also not deny that if I I have the thought that if I could be given like the chance to walk tomorrow, I would probably take it. But if it meant that I couldn't have what I'd had to this point, I don't think I would. Because it's one thing to want to go hiking, but what, all of the many things that I've learned along the way, I would never trade for anything else. And I know that's true. But now I am found was blessed.